Okay, and welcome, David. So um, I will read your <clears throat> bio. Uh, Michael Wayne, welcome to Voice for the Future. And with I'm Anadea Judith, and Michael and I have co-created this to talk with just illuminating people that we have had on about all kinds of topics and how we get through this mess we're in and, and create a thriving future. Yeah. So we're honored to have David Nevins today. And Michael, you go ahead and introduce yeah, him. Yeah, so I'll introduce you, David, and then we'll get right into talking. And um, so, David, you're the co-founder and chairman of the board of the Bridge Alliance. You, your background is such that you graduated with honors in economics from Penn State in 1969, and then get you got an MBA in finance from Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania in 1971. Um, and so as the co-founder and chairman of the Bridge Alliance, that's an alliance of 94 organizations who've come together in civility, respect, and goodwill as a powerful voice in the American political landscape, advocating country before party. And the Bridge Alliance works together to promote healthy self-government governance in America's democratic republic. Um, Bridge member organizations span the ideological spectrum, but are unified or unified to work efficiently outside arbitrarily defined political lines. And you're also the co-publisher of The Fulcrum, which is a publication of the Bridge Alliance. And, um, and you also have been involved with um, McCourtney, or, or the Nevins, you've established the Nevins Democracy Leaders Program, um, which is a signature initiative within the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State. And as you said, you're calling from Florida. You, you have residents in both Penn State, Pencil, in Pennsylvania, State College, Pennsylvania, and in um, Palm Beach, Florida. So welcome. So, so I guess we can start right away with um, how, did, how did it come to be that you started the Bridge Alliance? Wow. Uh, that's a fairly lengthy story. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Uh, I, never did anything in politics my entire life until 2012, um, 2010 actually. Uh, I always thought it was dysfunctional even back then where it was a lower level of dysfunction and partisanship. And I was always very interested, but never involved. I read all the newspapers, watched all the news shows and Sunday morning shows and was extremely interested, but always thought there was a lack of civil political discourse and critical thinking. And then I happened to be watching TV one day, I think it was uh, early 2011, and a group called No Labels uh, had their opening ceremony. And I saw a little news story on them and it appealed to me because they wanted to raise the conversation to a higher ground and have a problem solving approach to governance. And as a businessman, I always had that problem solving approach. So. Um, I became very casually involved. I think I sent him $50. And one thing led to another. And um, all over a period of six months, found myself on the executive board of No Labels and really started to learn about this field. And through my work with No Labels, I discovered there were many, many other organizations in the field that I had never heard of that were doing work to uh, create a more functional government. And so that led me to involvement in the Aspen Institute and uh, learning about some other great organizations, National Institute of Civil Discourse. And then I read a, a great study on collective impact, a Stanford study from, I believe, 2012. Um, and I can sum up this in-depth scholarly report in two sentences that no matter how well-funded and how well-managed any of these organizations are, you're never gonna have significant social and political reform unless you create some infrastructure, an entity that'll try to tie together, that will create a common agenda amongst these great social entrepreneurs and 90 organizations and some mutually reinforcing activities and media attention, et cetera, et cetera. So out of that concept grew the Bridge Alliance to provide that infrastructure and hopefully create a movement uh, that will change the political and social landscape in our country. Yeah. Is that the mission statement of the Bridge Alliance? 
I'd have to read that exactly. Um, <laughs> I, you know, that's funny. You should ask. Uh, I'd have to go to the website, but in in essence, um, we we want to. Uh, that does describe it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people who are listening want to know a little bit more about what the Bridge Alliance is. And yes. You there? Well, so. I could help you there a little in that the ninety four organizations. We divide them into three segments and probably really more. There are some that probably a third of them are really focused on infrastructure changes that I'm going to use the term the movement because we really believe there is a movement. And the term we use is cross partisan movement. Mm -hmm. And um, there are about 30 some odd organizations within the Bridge Alliance who are working on these structural changes so that the duopoly, which is another term we use for the Democrats and Republican, that uh, stronghold can be broken and independents can have a chance for, of getting elected. And whether those structural changes are gerrymandering reform, open primaries, ranked choice voting, campaign financing reform, et cetera, et cetera, I can go on and on. Those are what those organizations are focused on. And then we have probably another one third that are focused on the uh, tribalism, the uh, cultural divide that is separating us as a nation. And they have various approaches to resolving that uh, issue and bringing us closer together uh, on a cultural level. And then another third probably are involved more in the policy bipartisan issues, whether it's voting rights or uh, congressional management issues or things like that. Wonderful. And you've, it brings organizations together, you're saying, not just people, but whole organizations together to dialogue with each other. Yes, which to some extent can be like herding cats in a way. And I've learned a lot from this in that um, these organizations, these people are sometimes underfunded uh, and really hardworking. And for them, they all believe in principle in taking some time to work for the alliance, but they are so busy. It, it sometimes is difficult for them to take that principle into reality and have them devote maybe five or 10% of their time to working together to, uh, to, to raise all boats. The story yeah. of all of our lives these days. Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm actually with, with, well, 94 organizations that, that incorporates, I'm sure, thousands of people perhaps who are involved in those organizations. So, so do you have meetings or, or like how does, how does the Bridge Alliance function? Yeah, well, we, 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 we have a weekly update to all our members. Um, we uh, provide uh, through another company uh, media communication services to them. Uh, but in terms of meetings uh, prior to COVID, we have an annual summit. Uh, which brings us all together. And um, I can bring up something which uh, is, is relevant uh, because we were called out in the summer summit of 2018, like so many of these other events I go to within the field that most, a vast majority of the attendees were upper middle class white people. Hmm. And if you really are going to build a constituency of millions of Americans, you have to represent the diversity that is America. And we were called out on that and we took it to heart. And it's probably the best thing that ever happened to the Bridge Alliance because Debbie Lynn, our president and CEO, I don't know if it's her phrase, but we we didn't want to just talk about it. We didn't want to hire a, a research company to tell us how to do it. We just made it our operating system. And we just did it. And now uh, some of our key members of our staff are people of color. And it's not, not just racial diversity, it's political diversity, age diversity, um, all, all aspects of diversity. And that has become a major focus of the Bridge Alliance and has really uh, gained a lot of strength in terms of recognition from our members of the importance of it and uh, from uh, foundations who do some of the funding for the Bridge Alliance. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know you have a diversity report on the website and it showed 2020, 2021 report. I don't know if you have earlier reports, but I, I looked at the 2021 report and I saw that you're aiming, as you were saying, aiming to add more people of color, but also more people right of you know, across the ideological spectrum that you're, that I, I guess, I think it was saying that there's, that the bridge alliance is more left of center. I mean, not that they're left of center, but but more people representing one side and hoping to uh, be across the... Um... Yes, uh, that's a natural occurrence and it's, it's difficult. It's become, well, it's interesting now because there is a deep, deep division within the Republican party. And mm -hmm. uh, those, there are many, many conservatives now who are becoming more aligned with us because they see the necessity or the danger of where the Republican Party as a whole is going and the need to, uh, for those who are right of center and those who are left of center to work together. Yeah, that's, that's the big thing. Um, and and uh, you, you put a quote in, we had to ask you on the speaker forum, quotes that resonate with you. And you put in the quote from uh, Robert F. Kennedy that said, democracy is messy and it's hard, it's never easy. You know, that had to be, Robert F. Kennedy had to say that in the 60s, but um, you know, if he were alive today, he'd be not recognizing what's going on. I mean, yes. Well, it certainly is messy and another, I don't know where I got this from, but it's a key aspect and related to that quote is, it's not a spec, well, unfortunately it is, but it shouldn't be a spectator sport. And I truly believe most people, I get this all the time when I speak in public, everybody, not everybody, but people say, we, we love what you're saying. We believe in what you're saying, but things will never change. Right. And uh, I, I don't believe people realize how much power they have if they just want to have, take the time and energy to uh, become involved. And that is actually another major program of the Bridge Alliance, uh, if I might digress a bit, called Citizen Connect. Because when we do, either myself or others speak in public, citizens say, well, what can I do? And there needed to be a platform, a portal for citizens to go to answer that question. And we now created something about two months ago, uh, four months ago now, uh, called Citizen Connect, where citizens can go. And if you have a particular interest in a particular subject, you punch that in and you can find we have a database of 400 organizations in there. You can find organizations for the particular area of interest that, uh, that you would like to become involved in. And it keeps an updated calendar of events and it does it geographically. And now with, uh, with uh, webinars, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be geographic. So that's a, a, a strong component of our belief that through the fulcrum and through Citizen Connect, that this movement of well over 100 organizations, 100 of which belong to the Bridge Alliance, it's not just a fantasy. I mean, collectively, we have budgets of $800 million a year. Now that's a pittance compared to the billions and billions and billions that are spent uh, on political campaigns. And we try to encourage donors to, yes, support the candidate that you want elected, but just take 5% or 7% of your total donations and put it toward changing the, fixing the process and repairing the dysfunction that in our mind, no matter who gets elected, the dysfunction will still continue. Wonderful. I understand from your website, you have five principles that your members agree to. You wanna tell us about those? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll have to look it up. You know, I don't have this stuff memorized. <laughs> oh, I got it in front of me here. I, I, I know, I got it. Um, <laughs> um, you might have to uh, coach me a little. Okay, well, the first one, you could talk about each one. The first one was embracing difference, which you've already addressed a little bit, but maybe you could say a little more about it. Well, yes, and this is good if you mention each one, because uh, I have thoughts, obviously, about each one. What we do is far more than splitting the difference, yeah. splitting the middle. When people think of bipartisan, it's, it's in the middle. I believe what we're doing is far beyond that. It's 
taking the best from the left, taking the best from the right, but also being totally open-minded to a new world that we're living in that's going to take creative thinking and uh, taking democracy to a place it's never been before. So embracing differences means uh, embracing the differences that, that we feel is a great uh, attribute of our country. That's what makes us great. That's what uh, is the slogan on the Statue of Liberty. And um, only if we recognize that we're never going back to a country, no matter how much anybody might want it to be, where it was 80% white or whatever, we are a pluralistic, diverse society, and we have to learn to live together. We're all different, but that's what makes us great if we recognize that and embrace our differences. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. You know, I talk a lot about the transformation of the caterpillar into the butterfly. And when the butterfly emerges, it has a left wing and a right wing. <laughs> it can't fly without that. Yeah. So your second one was collaboration. Yes, yes. Well, um, listening is so critical. And from listening co comes collaboration. Um, so often, in, in, in politics, everybody has their opinion first, and then and, and, and had, finds the facts to justify the opinion they already have. Uh, I think uh, we need to reverse it and have deductive reasoning where we're open minded enough to collaborate with others who might have a different perspective. And, and yes, we all have biases. I have biases. We all have biases, but to recognize that uh, by collaborating with each other and learning that process. It's, it's, for some people, it's natural, but some people, it's a learning process. So I think it's critical that we learn as individuals and learn as a society how to communicate with each other and collaborate with each other uh, to bring about uh, stronger results and uh, address these really critical problems facing our country. Mm -hmm. Your next uh, five principles that you list, I'm glad I wrote these down, citizen voice. Well, that gets back to what I spoke to earlier. Most citizens really don't believe it, I don't think, but they really do have the power and the voice. Um, particularly, you don't have to focus on a national issue, but in your own community, a citizen can have a lot more power than they think. Or in my, back in my no labels days when I was much more involved with Congress, I was amazed how you know, a congressional district is not the whole state, it's a congressional district. And so few citizens become engaged that if you got, we found that 12 citizens who were organized could get a meeting with a member of Congress and could get that member of Congress ear. So citizens really do have a voice and that voice must be elevated. Uh, Otherwise, uh, the power is going to flow down from the top, as opposed to another principle. It's not one of the five principles, but uh, we believe in, in what we call new power. And that's the new power that is bottoms more bottom up than top down. Mm -hmm. Then your last two are solutions and open mindedness. Yes. Well, um, the solutions part maybe comes from uh, our, my business background. Um, that there's so much rhetoric out there um, that we have to really get beyond the rhetoric and really be solutions oriented. There are so many pressing problems that need attention. And, um, but I don't think we're gonna have the solutions unless the other three or four principles that you just mentioned are addressed. Combined with the the structural problems that even if you do have the collaboration and even if you do, uh, em we embrace our differences, there is a power structure. There is this duopoly that exists that stacks the odds against uh, breaking through to the, uh, the top-down power politics uh, uh, system that has, is controlled to a large extent by money but does not have to be if citizens realize they have the power to make the change. Wonderful. And your last one was open-mindedness, although I think you've addressed that a little. Yeah, I think I have, yes. Yeah. 
Michael, take it away. <laughs> yeah. So, Actually, so in I, terms I, of open mindedness, let me see. I'm sorry, Michael. Let me oh, see no, no, another please. quote because uh, I don't have many original thoughts. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Drucker from the Drucker Institute, I'm going brain dead on his first name now, Peter. a guru, uh, Peter Drucker Peter. of uh, management, had, was not a politically oriented guy, but has a great quote. And it, the quote is I'm not in favor of big government. I'm not in favor of small government. I'm in favor of government that works. Uh, and that's sort of an open mindedness. Don't go in thinking it's got to be smaller or it's got to be bigger. Let's let each problem has a different solution. And some might need bigger government and some might not. Yeah. So, so I have a couple of questions. First, just the fact that we're talking about the Bridge Alliance and it's trying to be across the ideological spectrum. Do you have, or what do you do with the people on the far right who are the most impossible to talk to, from my perspective, in my humble opinion, um, are there members in the Bridge Alliance or, or do you even try to reach out to them? Um, you know, talk stolen election, you know, and all yeah, this crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah. Well, this is actually a big issue of late. Um, we reach out to conservatives, but we do have to take a stand against lies, mm -hmm. against uh, authori uh, authoritarian behavior. So we, or obviously neo-Nazi behavior. So we don't reach out to everybody on the right. But um, and, but we also don't reach out to everybody on the extremes on the left either. There's closed mindedness on both sides. But we believe that if you eliminate and whatever that percentage might be of 15 percent. And it's probably a little bigger now, in all honesty, on the right than the left. But um, uh, there is still an, an ability to engage with conservatives now who and it's a big movement and a big problem within the Republican Party, which opens up an opportunity for us. There are many conservatives who are rejecting the events of January 6th and rejecting the big lie and uh, rejecting a lot of what Donald Trump stands for, who are much more open to engaging with us than they were previously. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, I think you need a big tent to, they're, they're, they're homeless, so to speak. Now, there is a, a bit of a problem we're facing in that there's a lot of fear out there, and justifiably so, about what will happen in, two th in the 2022 elections. Mm -hmm. And if Trump gains more and more power as a result, and what happens in 2024 if he should run again, and I don't think it's partisan to say that if he runs again, he will state from the outset that if he loses, it's been stolen. Mm -hmm. And now if the Congress at that point is, has a different political makeup, is, it real, is there really a threat to our democracy? So for years, we've been talking about the dysfunction, but more and more people are really worried. Of, and our strategy is a long-term strategy, a 10-year strategy. So we have a bit of a dilemma in that, how, how do you balance the fears and how realistic are the fears of this short-term serious threat to democracy versus a long-term plan for uh, restructuring uh, and repairing our democracy? Yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, you know, it's one thing when you bridge the gap over differences of opinions on an issue like abortion or immigration or whatever. It's another thing when, how do you deal with people that are in completely different information silos? Um, people that are, you know, believing, I guess, what we would call misinformation. And it, it's not just, a, you know, their opinion is based on a completely different set of information. Where do you find the common ground in that? Well, I don't want to give you the impression that we do always find the common ground. It, it is very difficult. And some people you will never, never find a common ground. But um, if you try to have 
discussions as opposed to the political rhetoric now uh, that's going on now, um, you, you can make progress. For example, what's happening in Virginia in the governor's race, mm -hmm. the Republican who's running is obviously fear-mongering, critical race theory, what's happening in school boards across the country, um, uh, 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 wokeness, you know, and, and all that stuff and raising fears. And um, we have found success in this, that we can have discussions with people who are accept, who are just buying into that fear. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, a, a deep, intelligent discussion as to how should we address issues of political correctness? How far back should we go in a person's history? And we've, we have had good progress in those areas. So uh, we, we try to get beyond the political slogans and uh, we have found some success. Yeah, well, that's good. Um, David, you had talked about the democracy work you're doing out, you know, like the long-term democracy work you're doing, you know, not, you know, trying to move forward and have long-term vision past 2022, 2024. Can you say some about what that work looks like? Well, it, it, it's in terms of the structural reform, I, I don't know how many people on this phone call have heard of ranked choice voting. Oh, sure. uh, but if they have, they can look it up. It's a slow process. But right now, we had an article written about today. There's five, six, seven cities across the country that have em employed ranked choice voting. And that is taking six, seven, eight years to do. So to have ranked choice voting or open primaries uh, instituted or uh, a 28th Amendment which one of American Promise, one of our members is trying to achieve that'll uh, uh, overturn the Supreme Court Citizen United ruling so that uh, corporations are not considered people and it'll limit the huge amount of money allowed to uh, go to uh, any particular candidate. These things take time. Mm -hmm. So that's our long run objective that these things will take 10, 15, 20 years. Each one is incremental. Each one of these changes can help on a local level, but um, change takes time. Yeah. Well, they're all, they're, all of them are all about making democracy work for everyone. So, you know, just as you talk about changing the, having a, a, an amendment to the constitution about Citizen United so that it's not just democracy working or not working for the people with the money who are who are funding many politicians. Yes. Now, one thing I haven't talked about in terms of the long term is 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 civic engagement. And many of our organizations are involved in that. Mm -hmm. The statistics on what young people, their knowledge of democracy and whether they care about democracy is a bit scary. Mm -hmm. It oh. really is. And um, again, so that's long term. We have to do things within our school districts and have uh, uh, perhaps volunteer programs so students can get more engaged. But it's critical that if, if the younger generation doesn't care about democracy, uh, the long term doesn't look good. Yeah. So are these um, surveys or studies you've done about when you talk about what's scary about young people's ignorance? Um, we rely on other strategic partners we have to do uh -huh. those surveys for us. And, you know, sometimes we call on just uh, the big uh, data management companies out there. But one of our strategic partners is, is at Tufts University, an entity there. I uh, can't remember the exact name, but Peter Levine uh, is, works very close with us and has one of the world experts on, uh, on social and political movements and um, on the data related to what uh, young people think about democracy. And he wrote this wonderful book I'll, uh, here, which I love the title. I don't know if you can read it. We oh. are the ones we've been waiting for. Uh-huh. The promise of civic renewal in America. And 
I really believe that, that we really are the ones we've been waiting for if we could just coalesce and create the collective impact to have our voices heard. Why do you think, David, that at this point in time, there is so much polarization? It's certainly the worst that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, you know, and I was probably when I was young, I wasn't so interested in, in politics and things too. But as I've gotten older, I followed it for many years. And it just seems like the polarization is getting worse and worse. Why do you think that is so at this time? And does it have an evolutionary purpose in evolving democracy? Well, I can give a structural reason and I can give a, another reason. And I'm sure there are many, many other reasons. I do think I keep referring to gerrymandered reform and the, the congressional districts have been redrawn in such a manner that while roughly, I'm citing statistics, but it's fairly close, 85% of Americans think Congress is dysfunctional, but 85 to 90% of our Congress people in Congress get reelected every year. <laughs> and part of it is these lines that are redrawn in many uh, congressional districts, is it impossible for a Democrat to win or a Republican to win? So what that does is basically the election is decided in the primary. And as low as our voter turnout is in the general elections, the voter turnout is minuscule in the primaries. So that if you appeal to the extremes, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you don't need much of a turnout in a primary to get nominated and then you'll get elected. So that is one answer. Another answer, I was gonna use this term in combination with the ex-president, I'm not sure if I use should, the genius of Donald Trump was, was polarizing his constituency. Mm -hmm. I believe he is a big factor mm -hmm. in not the only factor, the polarization has been increasing for the structural reasons I've been describing, uh, but he has, I think, increased the rate of that uh, through fear mongering, pitting uh, one class, one race against others. Mm -hmm. Also social media. And yes, yes, yes. We'd like to be, re we're all in our own tribes right now. You know, it's, it's you know, a lot of people have said this, uh, you know, when we were, when I was growing up, we watched three networks and the three networks had to appeal to everybody. Now you can just watch Fox or you yeah. can just watch MSNBC. You can just listen to the message from your own tribe. Yeah. My gym the other day and they'd taken MSNBC off the choices and put Fox in its place. Uh, and I yeah. raised holy hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there were no easy and then social media. I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that that up. Uh, that's a, a huge, huge uh, problem. I don't know if you've seen the I think it's Netflix, Social Dilemma. Sure. But that highlights the, the problem we have with that. Yeah. And yeah. actually, Debbie Lynn, our, our CEO, she's got a term for it, but, um, and, and I'm not using the right term, but she, she believes, she wants to start something trolling for good. She believes huh. we, can, we can flip it. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is actually demonstrating the power of a relative nobody to create a movement and have influence. So if they can do that in a negative way, That's a relative right. nobody ought to be able to make a positive influence. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was reminded of what you're what you're talking about, David. Um, I was read an article today in the New York Times, um, an investigative piece about the upcoming trial or the tri the trial that's starting for the young guy Kyle Rittenhouse who went to Kenosha, Wisconsin last year from his neighboring state of Illinois and, and shot and killed a few people. So they were talking about how it came to me, like the background and the, you know, starting with George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protesters and how so the protests got violent. And then these paramilitary, the Times article calls these guys paramilitary, paramilitia, and, and they were empowered by Trump and empowered by social media and Facebook, these groups on Facebook that started rallying people come to Kenosha with your weapons and 
you know, then this one kid got carried away and you know, yep. it's really unfortunate. His mother even went with him. His mother <laughs> drove him. He wasn't old enough yeah. to drive. Yeah, it's just crazy. Um, so, but um, yeah. So, so with your democracy work you do, David, is what parts do you enjoy and what parts um, do you feel frustrated by? Well, uh, I feel frustrated by a lot of things. Um, the thing I am enjoying the most is the recent uh, pro, uh, uh, program of the Fulcrum, the digital platform that we took over in May. And um, I love journalism. I've been doing some writing on it. And the thing that's bringing me the greatest enjoyment in the last two months related to the Fulcrum is we relaunched the Fulcrum about six weeks ago and we have a pop culture section within the Fulcrum. And I am, believe it or not, at my age, I'm leading that section, but hopefully we'll have a, a group of great young people uh, leading it in the not too distant future. But I strongly, strongly believe there's a deep connection between pop culture and democracy. And if we're gonna create this movement, we're not gonna create it by having a wonky, intellectual publication that talks about all the things I've been talking about that most people really do not care about. We have to relate to people uh, in a manner that excites them, impacts their emotions, and, uh, and, and I believe music, poetry, drama, theater, dance can all do so. As a child of the late 60s, early 70s, Music was very powerful, culturally and politically. And uh, so I think that's, to answer your question, that's what's most exciting for me now in the work I'm doing. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Music definitely is uh, something that can people can find a common bond and commonalities. And boy, do we need those commonalities. And, and what really excited me, and before, before this happened in the last few months, I lose track of the time. It was right before the 2019 summit that we had. Um, I, I went to see the show Hamilton and um, learned a lot about the show and how uh, having our forefathers represented by people of color singing in hip hop engaged a whole generation of people who knew nothing or could care less about democracy. And it became an incredible uh, phenomenon in uh, karaoke in bars across the country, something I didn't even know existed. And we were so fortunate. Uh, I actually communicated with, I went a little off the deep end, I must say. Uh, one of the best songs in uh, uh, Hamilton is, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm going brain dead. Um, it'll come to me. Um, Can't help you on that because I, I remember watch, seeing the show. Oh, and my shot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry oh, for yeah. the pause, the, the senior moment there. My shot. And uh, so I wrote a song at that time. I think I was 70, 71. I wrote a song, I'm 71 and it's my shot, which yeah. I feel in terms of the work I do. And I had the audacity to send it to Lynn Manuel Miranda. And, uh, and he wrote me back and uh -huh. he loved the work we did. And we were able to get a license to do two of his songs at our summit in 2019. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when we look at the, the panorama of history and even just 30, 40, 50 years, we can say, boy, we've really, a lot of good has happened. You know, even shows like Hamilton and just the diversity and, 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 and yet there's a lot of things not so great happening. You know, history kind of has three steps forward, two steps back, but um, you know, it's just, we want, we want to go all the way. So yeah, we do. And it's easy to dwell on the negative, but there, there really has been enormous progress made. And um, you asked me before, what, what brings me the greatest joy? I love working with young people. Yeah. Uh, um, 
and I work with them through the Nevins Fellowship Program at Penn State. And uh, their openness and um, understanding Again, they're sort of living into it. They don't think so much of black and white. My granddaughter, who's now six years old, uh, all, all the things she watches on TV have black and white people. And I just see her interactions in class and her, that their mindset is different. So I think there is a lot of hope, mm -hmm. uh, despite the... the uh, potential serious, serious problems we have. I mean, we haven't even touched on the environment and the climate, which is a whole other issue. Yeah, and ultimately that's that seems to be the, the biggest arbitrating factor of them all. Yes, indeed. Well, what do you see and what's going on right now with like the bills that Biden's trying to get through and the opposition and the polarization there? Well, it highlights the dysfunction. Um, if I was selfish, I mean, it's good for the, the business I'm in. It's good for the rich alliance. <laughs> it, it really does highlight it, that uh, they, they can't come to an agreement. And uh, I don't know what happened today, whether they finally did or not. And, uh, but maybe it speaks to the quote you, you, you cited earlier, that democracy is messy and it's slow. Uh, but there's a difference between being slow and messy and totally dysfunctional and not being able to get anything done. So I guess the proof is still in the pudding whether they will be able to pass something. Yeah. Um, I tend to think they will. Yeah, and, and that speaks to, I, I don't know if this is something that comes up in a lot of Bridge Alliance conversation, I would think so. Just the makeup, you know, this bill, the makeup of the Senate and the two things that are the biggest obstacles is the filibuster and and the disproportionate represent representation that the Senate um, has of each state with two senators. So as is well known, California, Wyoming, each have equal say. Um, so is that something that that does is a topic of that gets discussed at the Bridge Alliance or membership? Um, well, not really in terms of the the composition of the Senate, where there's a disproportionate amount of power to a state like Idaho versus California, where you both have two senators, because that's the way it's been designed. Now, there are, we do have, and there's going to be an op-ed by a political science professor, uh, opening up the discussion that the Constitution should evolve a little more rapidly. Yes. But what, then you get a trade-off. I mean, if you discard it, you open yourself up to potential dangers if you can just discard it and who's going to be the determining factor of what's better and what's worse. So we don't have a lot of discussions about that. We do have a lot of discussions about term limits, uh -huh. which is not generally one of those structural changes that most of our organizations are uh, advocating the strongest. Like but for the Supreme Court? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 or term limits on the Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I should make a distinction between the Bridge Alliance and the members of the Bridge Alliance. Mm -hmm. The policy making organizations who are focused on subjects like that probably are having a lot of discussions about that. Bridge Alliance, we are more um, uh, uh, focused on the movement as a whole and what our role is and how we can help uh, create uh, communication streams amongst them so that can be less duplicative work, how we can maybe merges are important. If you have three organizations doing the same thing, uh, maybe they should be working together. And um, a perfect example of what worked a few years ago, I told you before that they all believe that if we work together, we'd be better off, but they, they all have their, they don't have the time or energy to do so. So we were fortunate enough in 2017 to provide a half million dollars in grants to our members under this stipulation. At least three or more of them had to work together on a project. Mm. And the grants averaged about 50,000. I think it was actually 600,000. So we had about 12 grants. And that whole process was incredibly 
a great learning experience. Some of those projects are still in existence today, four years later. But what I found most profound was that in their enlightened self-interest to get the money, they started communicating with each other, learning about each other. And many of the organizations who did not get the grants, but came to know each other through the process are still working together, despite yeah. the fact they didn't get the grant. So the alliances hold. I've always wanted to see that happen in the environmental movement. I get so many, you know, there's so many different environmental movements that are all trying to do the same thing. If we could just make, put them all together, we'd have an alternative EPA, you know? Um, exactly. And again, this uh, gentleman, Peter Levine, who's the expert on these movements in that book I showed you, goes back to the civil rights movement and how there were great divisions within the civil rights movement and, mm -hmm. and how things would happen faster if uh, some of these entities uh, started working together. There is a, one major funder in the field who funds just mergers. He believes that the, we have to have larger organizations and these organizations should uh, merge. Oh, that's really great. It, it, and now that you're talking about it, I see the wisdom even more so than I already did of the Bridge Alliance in bringing groups who, who are all, as we're talking about, all doing all this work, getting to know each other and, and merging or just being able to communicate with each other so there's not redundancy or just everyone can be on the same page at what, whatever level um, and how important that is, you know, it's whether critical. grants are given or... Especially yeah. when you have limited funding, there is a lot of redundancy. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, and I think it was Peter Levine. I know you and I were talking, David, a few weeks back, who who had the the theory of um, when three percent of the population are nonviolent movements. When three percent of the population is there, that's when the movement becomes successful or things change. Exactly, which is roughly roughly twelve million Americans. Which is it's not a crazy wild idea that we could garner that much support. I mean, our our members collectively have a social media impact of about 2.4 million. Oh. Um, yeah. So. It, so you're it, getting there. Well, this gets a whole other social media impact. You know, they define it as clicks, impressions, this and sharing, likes. So it's a, a step above for actually active citizen engagement, but it starts with getting the eyeballs and getting the clicks and the impressions and engagement. You see that the internet can transform how we do democracy? Yes, both in the positive and negative. Yeah. Um, one of our members, Sol focuses on mobile voting, which is a whole other subject if we go. Um, so technology is changing the world. We all know yeah. that and in geometric rates. I mean, who would have believed uh, wh where we are today 10 years ago? So it sort of would be foolish to think that it won't change democracy mm -hmm. and how, how democracy should function. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a, you know, some different way of voting and that it isn't going to a poll place. It's voting through the internet and yep. you know, um, how do you keep one vote per person? But, you know, that there's ways to work that out, you know? Um, that it could make a different kind of, of system. Yes. So you, uh, you have something on your website called the Healthy Self-Governance Movement. What is that? Well, it's, it's just, it's a marketing term, I have to be honest. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the part of creating a constituency is, I mean, how best do we define ourselves? Are we country before party? Are we healthy self-governance, a healthy democracy movement? Um, are we repairing our democracy? Are we evolving our democracy? So it's really all the same thing. Um, but the term healthy, I think, is very apt in that uh, what's happening now is unhealthy. I mean, uh, I guess it's a different way of expressing dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but unhealthy maybe implies the a little bit more of the cultural aspect of it that I think the way we we feel about others who are fellow countrymen is inherently unhealthy. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. For us individually, for our souls, yes. for the soul of our nation. So maybe the unhealthy gets a little into the, the soul of our nation. Well, in many ways, it's a changing narrative because the country was kind of founded on rugged individualism and everyone being for themselves. And now we're moving to an era where we have to look at the collective experience. We have to look at the underprivileged. We have to look at the whole picture. And it's been built on something that's really been favoring the individual over the collective. And now we have to make a shift in balance there. Yes. But speaking to the partisanship and uh, our former president, he, he has, that creates a lot of fear in a lot of people. And justifiably, where are the, those disenfranchised, not the disenfranchised that left the center to speak of, the marginalized who truly have been over the years, but the blue collar worker in West Virginia, you know, where, where is he left in this rapidly changing world? Um, so we have to address that, that. marginalized of, of people of color, marginalized of the uneducated in West Virginia, uh, all those who are marginalized and don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and, and it's, um, here it is, our preamble to the, our constitution says, we the people. So it, it's an interesting dichotomy, as you point out, Adadea, that rugged individualism is a, a theme, and yet there was this ideal of we the people. What, what, what would you say that means to you, David? Well, essentially what we've been talking about, I really believe that the voice of the people which historically was much, much worse than it is now. I mean, the power interests in the 1800s, uh, the power interests before uh, Roosevelt's New Deals, before trade unions, before blacks voted, before women voted, uh -huh. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, what it means to me that people really can have a voice if they wish to have one. Mm -hmm. So let's do a little fantasy, David. If you were to fast forward uh, 10, 20, 30 years, what would you see as a democracy that's working? I'd see that the public, the citizens, has, are in, in touch with democracy to the extent that they don't buy into the black-white argument, not racial, but black-white argument, or buy into the simplistic stuff that politicians feed them. They don't buy into the fear-mongering. That you don't have negative ads on TV anymore, not because it's legislated against having them, but because people just don't buy into them. That there's a higher consciousness, mm -hmm. which gets into the different components of the democracy movement. We're not going to succeed just with the structural changes unless there's a higher consciousness in human beings. So that's my vision. And to answer your question, uh, Debbie Lynn, our, um, our president, took your question in a way I thought she was actually a little crazy because uh, I guess I'm more I'm a business guy. So, uh, but anyway, she in our convention in 2019. She decided she was going to transport us all 30 years from then hmm. to the year 2000, whatever, 49, to get us away from being in the present moment and then reverting these bigger discussions about what is our vision for democracy. And if we could separate ourselves from what did Trump say today, what did Biden do, what's happening. And I thought it would never work, but she actually had this time machine and these flashing lights and the whole thing. And for the entire two days, people were talking as if they were 30 years beyond, and they were reflecting on how their work for the past 30 years transformed our country culturally and politically. And they expressed, they answered that question that you just asked uh, so well, better than I could ever articulate. 
And that could be a great way to get polarized people to talk about, you know, where do you ask both sides of the fence? Where do you see it in, in yes. 2040 or 2050 or something like that? Yeah. And how do you, how do we get there? Yeah. yeah and, it, and it reminds me like what, what you said, David, about higher consciousness. It reminds me of the famous saying from James Madison of if, if men, well, people were angels, no government would be necessary. So <laughs> You know, there's Peter Drucker, as you point out, say he's in favor of good government, not big government, not small government. So, you know, we could we could say that perhaps we never not need government, but good government. And if people were angels or higher consciousness or, you know, somewhere in that future where we can look and think for the greater good and, and be that be our recurring theme. It would be wonderful. But you probably run into the same thing as, as I do, Michael. When you say things like that, people think you're a dreamer. You know, <laughs> it'll never, I get that all the time. Yeah, that's really nice, David. It's never going to happen. But I've been doing this so long, I have a standard response. I, I can't say it'll ever happen. But yeah. I can say one thing with 100% certainty, that if no one tries, it will never happen. That's uh -huh. right. Yeah, and there's a lot of things that have happened that people thought would never happen. You know, That's, the Berlin Wall yeah. came down. You know, people yeah. thought that would never happen. You know, for one example, so there's been a lot. Well, this is the point in the hour when we open it up to questions from the listeners. Yeah, and, we, have a, uh, we have a we're in a webinar format, so you have to type it into the chat. But if you want to type any questions you want to ask of David, um, you can type it into the chat, and we'll read them off. Yeah, and I have a, a question that came through the question and answer box. So that's another one if you have the Q&A box on your, the bottom of your screen. So I have um, a bunch of questions from Grace. Um, let's see, I'll kind of combine them. But first, she, she talked about our democracy is at risk. And she said that NPR just had an interview with the book, uh, Wood, Bob Woodward and, uh, Woodward and Costa book, Peril. Um, so that's not much, that's not really a question, more a comment, I guess, but I think that's what we've been talking about in um, Woodward's book, you know, about Trump and, you know, a bun bunch of books coming out that have been about the last few months of Trump and, and post-election. But um, let's see. Now, Grace also asked, what about funding a series of popular books on the essence of democracy beyond all divisions of conservative or liberal? Um, the well, that's actually, yeah, that's yeah. actually a, a great idea um, and, and timely because at the fulcrum, uh, we are thinking of uh, publicizing books. I, I'm getting more and more of them every day. Here's one, American Democracy in Crisis. And the one I held up earlier, we are the ones we've been waiting for. I have a whole shelf here, the reunited States of America, reunited States of America. So I think that's a fantastic idea. And the fulcrum, which is the fulcrum.us, if anybody, it's free, uh, wants to uh, read it, read about us. Uh, and that is a great idea. We are going to start uh, doing some book reviews. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, someone else asked, saying that the, on NPR, Today, they heard um, there was a discussion about problems with Facebook and WhatsApp. As, as it was announced, Facebook is rebranding, coming up with their name. And, and just saying they've come across, this is what we were talking about, saying person also writes, I've been coming across a lot of conspiracy stuff on YouTube. So um, there's not a really a question there, but the question is, um, how do we counter this, this misinformation? Uh, I don't know if that's not an easy answer, David, but just you know, person brought it up. Yeah, I don't have the answer to that question, except for the fact that it's a very complex question. And this is one of those questions, the Senate hearings lately, there has been a bipartisanship on that. Yeah. And everybody is outraged. Although at the same time, no one's come up with a concrete proposal as to what to do. But um, unlike a lot of other issues, I think there is a common realization. So there is hope in that direction, but you really have to, on all these issues, there's always important discussions on, you know, how much do we want the government to censor? And it gets into the trade-off between censorship and a private 
business in this highly uh, computerized age, uh, just um, using algorithms to incite and attract people? How do you, what is that balance? And probably all these questions come down to a question of balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that gets into critical thinking and te teaching, and this is my passion through the Nevins Fellows Program where we have the brightest kids because it's a very popular uh, course now, uh, learning on collaboration and the deliberative dialogue process. Oh. And learning in the classroom and then the, the, the top half of the class get to practice it in real life in an internship in a program in the summer at one of these uh, programs, one of these uh, uh, NGOs, one of the Bridge Alliance members often. So they learn in the field. And it's been incredible how it's changed their lives. Even if they don't go into government, just learning how to deliberative dialogue with others who think differently and do it in a civil manner and trying to recognize, not eliminate totally, but recognize one's own biases. Mm -hmm. um, Lynn asks, is your organization involved in the upcoming United Nations uh, meeting on climate change? The one coming up in Glasgow. Um, well, as I said before, we aren't particularly, but um, there's a uh, organization, <clears throat> several, but one in particular that's extremely uh, focused on climate change. And I would say probably yes to that question. The name of that organization is Future 500. And I suggest you check them out. That's a nice thing about having many organizations. You don't all need to do everything. You can get that's right. covered yes. by some organizations being more into climate change and others <clears throat> more into, you know, healing racism or you know other other poverty issues. Definitely. Or, yeah. Definitely. Uh, and, Dave, do the do the organization organizations give you um, and and um, the CEO of Bridge Alliance uh, progress reports? So you're always under up with what's going on and what they're doing. Yes. Yes. And, and a new uh, feature of the fulcrum is we want to publish these uh, progress reports oh. uh, to me I mean, some things you can't measure as easily as others. You can't measure easily bridging the divide or the cultural differences that separate us, but you certainly can measure progress in legislation and climate change legislation in voting rights Right now, it's the lack of progress, but anyway, progress in voting rights legislation. Uh, so yes, we are trying to have much more measurable results for our members. And obviously for the Bridge Alliance itself, for us to get funding, we have to have measurable results. Uh -huh. you know, how many Citizen Connect, if we want people to fund that, how many people are actually connecting and becoming involved if we're spending X dollars and if we doubled it, how many more would be involved? How many people, the 170,000 eyeballs I spoke of last month for the fulcrum? Well, if someone gave us X dollars, could it go to a million? Could it go to a million five? And how would we spend X dollars to make that happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, I'm um, sorry, because this oh, is so important to me. And in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, if we had dollars, so that we could go into communities across this country and support the incredible community leaders who are doing some really important work in their communities and, and establish relationships with them by a collaborative process, not asking them to come to us to support our democracy movement, but us, being able to go to them and help them in the work that they do that's most important to them. Yeah. Um, so I have another question from Lisa, but um, just want to ask you, Dave, I put the Bridge Alliance link, I've put it a few times in the chat box so, you, so people can just click on it. So people who are listening, whether live or who watch the recording, if they're interested in the work of the Bridge Alliance and member groups, how could they get involved or know what's going on or, or any whatever they would like? Well, the easiest way is go to the website um, 
and uh, just sign up and you'll get a weekly update. That's yeah. the easiest way. Or go to uh, the Fulcrum and subscribe. And it's everything I'm telling you about is free. And you'll get a free uh, email every day with the current, we publish two or three or four stories every day, the fulcrum.us. Okay. Or, and when you're on the Fulcrum, or go to citizenconnect.us and punch in what most fascinates you. If it's climate change, punch in climate change. If it's uh, racial equity, punch that in and you'll find something near where you live that you could become involved with. Yeah, and the Bridge Alliance on their, on the website, um, I think under projects or, or it lists like events, all your member organizations and events they're doing now, upcoming, past, or at least upcoming and now. So that's another what great resource for people to know, you know, what's going on, plug into a webinar or, or whatever it might be. Yes, you could do that through our website. I think it's uh, now that Citizen Connect is up and going, that's probably a little uh, more comprehensive. Yeah, but that's wonderful. So, so Lisa asked a question. Um, there are so many problems we can point to for ills and divisions in society today, but I think the breakdown, and in many places, the intentional dismantling of public education is one of the greatest problems. Um, yeah, so. Well, that's, that sounds like my wife in that, yes, so if, we, if, if we can't, uh, you know, so much of the future depends, obviously, duh, on our children. So, yeah. yes, the education component is is huge and we have members of the bridge alliance who just focus on on civic education from k uh k through 12. oh that's wonderful yeah i think it's called uh generation citizen is oh. we have several and then we have organizations who are just focused on uh college uh kids and getting them more involved whether it's the young invincibles or uh I mean, I, I can rattle off a lot of names. And then we have a, a really powerful organization is a Millennial Action Project. Oh. Uh, is focused on getting millennials involved. And one of them, the founder of that organization who left, is now running for a senator in Wisconsin. Wow. State senator or U.S. senator? U.S. senator to, to in the Democratic primary to unseat Ron Johnson. Ron Johnson, yes. Wow. And one of our former leaders of uh, Stand Up Republic is running as an independent for senator in Utah. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's, that is. So that is a whole other aspect, which I didn't even talk about, which is leadership. Uh -huh. and leadership training, which ultimately could lead to a new generation of citizens with a different mindset on everything we talked about actually running for office. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's one of my passions in leadership and leadership among the young people. What are some of your success stories then, David? <laughs> the fact that we still exist seven years. <laughs> no. um, I think we, we've got a, a lot of success stories because this was really, the movement has grown phenomenally. And again, the people on the phone call can't visualize it uh, because it's not, main, mainstream media doesn't cover it. But we are getting attention from sources that we've never had before in a, in a big way. I get calls from mainstream media, whether it's New York Times or Washington Post, who would never have talked to me five or six years ago. So we, we are breaking through in terms That's of practical real. Yeah, we're getting recognition. But we've also had some real wins in terms of ranked choice voting, for example, in terms of actually, this is an organization uh, represent us, one of the bigger ones, um, who believes because Congress is so dysfunctional, we got to start on the state level. And they have passed their, they have a strong citizen base. It's resulted in quite a bit of legislation 
in uh, campaign financing reform, the swinging door, you know, regulations on what past uh, members of state legislatures can do after they're no longer uh, members. Uh, so we've made, they've made a lot of progress on the state level in corruption, particularly. Um, so we, we, um, we have a lot of real success in terms of legislation, probably less success, and this gets back to the discussion earlier, whether it's Trump or whether it's social media or whether it's gerrymandering problems. We've made small individual successes in a particular town at a particular meeting where we brought people from the left and right together. But on a national level, uh, I think we've actually probably gone back. Well, yeah, I'm quite sure we've gone backwards. Well, like you say, it takes time. And sometimes it goes backwards before it goes forward. Yes. I mean, I don't know if it's an app metaphor or not, but alcoholics normally have to hit bottom before they uh, they recognize the problem. And maybe the country God, it, it's getting close to that. Yeah. Well, let's hope not. But um, yeah. <laughs> but but I think the, the plus of that is more of us recognize that. I mean, it helps, as you said, it helps the bridge alliance bring members or mobilize people mobilize or maybe bring more donors in. But but yeah, we we um, it's almost all hands on deck at this point to yeah. ship. Yes. Uh, yeah. So um, we haven't had any other questions in, so I guess we can wind it down. Um, yeah, David. Um, you know, thank you for for taking the time and thank you for your work as he's hurting the cats, but, but really helping the democracy project that has been in the U.S. 200 and almost 50 years or yeah. something like that. Um, um, well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, despite how often I talk about this, I enjoy it every time. Yeah. Because there's always new questions. Uh, and, and these were really uh, thought provoking questions. So I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you answered them very well. And uh, yeah. we even had a comment in the chat box about, you know, uh, Alan says, David, you are knowledgeable, believable and inspirational. So um, there's some appreciation there. And uh, if anybody wants to write appreciation for David right now before we sign off, you can. Oh. And uh, our next interview is November 16th. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. It's um, David, it's the person I introduced you to, Bo Breslin, who's um, a uh, constitutional scholar, a um, professor of political science, chair of, I think, public policy at Skidmore College. And he's written a very um, interesting book called A uh, Constitution for the Living. Um, I think that's who you were talking about is writing the article, David. Yes. And it's a book based on the ideas of Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson firmly believe that the constitution should be rewritten every generation. So Bo, and so Bo in the book, it's part scholarly writing about those ideas. And then he um, has different chapters imagining a constitutional convention of different eras in America where a constitution gets rewritten or revised and added on. And um, yeah, that's, uh, it, it's a very fascinating conversation that he, that he um, in the book. So Bo, Bo will have a lot to say. And it I'm will glad. be fascinating. I spoke to him for the first time yesterday. Thank you oh, for good. introducing me. And everybody will love it. I think they should attend. Yeah, yeah. Is, um, yeah. So that's November 16th. Yeah. So um, yeah, we thank you, David. It's um, You're quite welcome. Thank you all. Yeah. And thanks to all our listeners. And join us on November 16th for the next one. And we are interviewing Voices for the Future. Yeah. And this is how we make the future. We create it together. We figure it out as we go along because we're going to a place we've never been before. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank bye you bye. everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.